Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight, the magical world of the Embassy Community Center. Um, tonight, we are reopening and continuing the public hearing related to the Board of Trustees site plan review and decision on an application for the redevelopment and renovation of the property at 75 Main Street, otherwise known as the Oceana Building. Uh, so at this time, let me formally take a motion to reopen the public public hearing. Is there a motion? Uh, Trustee Golio, second. Trustee Corrales, all in favor? And that, uh, that passes with six ayes. So the public hearing is formally reopened. Uh, let me just give a, a quick background again. I, I know most of you who are, who are here know why you're here and know what we, we are uh, going to be talking about tonight, which is mostly listening from, from you and taking input from the residents. But just let me give a, a bit of quick background because I think there are some people that may be here for the first time and just for the benefit uh, of everybody, the reason why we're here. Uh, the BOT, uh, the Board of Trustees, has received a recommendation from the Village's Planning Board dated January 6, 2016, to approve a mixed-use proposal for the renovation redevelopment of the property at 75 Main Street. After an re initial review in July of 2015 by the Village's Building Department, Planner and Engineers, the application was then referred in September of 2015 by the Board of Trustees to the Planning Board for site plan review, which included um, from the Board of Trustees uh, consideration for potential zoning change. Following several months of review at the Planning Board, public meetings and workshops which were held, including joint meetings of the Planning Board and the Architectural Historical Review Board, as well as several public hearings which included a significant amount of public input, a recommendation was passed by a resolution of the Planning Board, three to one, in favor of approval. The Planning Board's recommendation includes, includes certain conditions of approval. Uh, these are outlined in detail in the Planning Board's resolution, which is available on the Village's website, and you can come to Village Hall and certainly, certainly get this. Um, in detail, which we've previously pointed out, but including, again, just for the benefit, uh, limiting the total residential units in the proposal to 24, uh, that's, I think, come down a little bit, but that is including the front and the back building, a maximum of eight units in the black, uh, back building, uh, facade and exterior renovations in the front building uh, are to be done to meet New York State historical building standards. Uh, the building in and of itself is to achieve uh, LED standards, LEED standards. Uh, there are drainage and runoff improvements that have been proposed. Uh, again, and these are conditions. A one-time payment to the segregated Villages Recreation Fund of $240,000 or $10,000 a unit, so it depends upon the uh, total number of units, uh, and other specific conditions related to the site and the building. Um, also in the Planning Board's resolution that their uh, final proposal is consistent with the Villages adopted master vision plan and particularly to achieve a streetscape design in the downtown district area and to encourage more residential housing in the downtown uh, to encourage a more pedestrian friendly community and foot traffic to help vitalize the downtown business merchants the approval is of course subject to the architectural and historical review board having final approval on the architectural components of the proposal that's also in the planning board's resolution I would add that the Board of Trustees is in receipt of a letter from the Chair of the Architectural Historical Review Board indicating the AHRB is generally in favor of the design and bulk, but that there still is work to be done. In addition to the Planning Board's recommendation for approval, also includes the Board of Trustees should consider its authorization under the Village Code pursuant to Section 300-52E to grant waivers specifically for certain setback and height provisions. And in the Planning Board's resolution specifically they state if it, and this is in the Village Code, if in its judgment, it being the Board of Trustees, such waiver or more, uh, modification will be consistent with the purpose of prom promoting the health, safety, or general welfare of the community and permit a site-specific plan that is equal to or better than the strict application of the standards of this chapter. So that's basically in the Planning Board's resolution. It's not the Board of Trustees, that's the Planning Board's resolution. So that's what we're considering. Uh, the meetings to date on January 12th, the Board of Trustees held its, well, received an initial presentation from the developer and their representatives, 
And this was the first time that this uh, matter was before the Board of Trustees. That was January 12th. Uh, January 26 was the first public hearing that I know a lot of you were, were at. Um, and so tonight is the second public hearing and the reopening of that public hearing. So that's just a little bit of background. In terms of how I'd like to run the meeting tonight, and we're gonna, we will take people in order in groupings of three. And I want to see a show of hands at the time, but group one, and this will be our first priority, is any of, any of you who attended the last meeting but you were not able to speak due to the time allotted, you will go first tonight. Okay, so that's group one, and I'll ask you to raise your hands. I'm gonna go around the room. We're gonna get through that group first as a priority. Group two, which is second priority of any of those who are here tonight that have not spoken, that we haven't heard from before. So after we get through group one, we'll go through group two. And again, I'll just randomly pick. And then time permitting, because we wanna, Close at 10.30, which will give us three hours. I think that's plenty of time to hear from everybody, certainly that hasn't spoken before. But if there is time remaining uh, before 10.30, um, anybody who has already spoken and wants to come up for a second or third time, we'll, we'll try to get to as many of you as possible. Um, I'm going to select randomly. Um, everyone who has not yet spoken will absolutely get a chance to be heard. There's no, no doubt about that. I want to ask, plead, the, the entire board asks that everyone be civil and respectful of everyone's uh, opinions and comments, regardless of what your position on, on this matter is, whether you love it or you hate it, you're somewhere in between or you don't know. At the last meeting, some speakers were intimidated and threatened. This has never happened before in any meeting that I've chaired, and it was unfortunate, and it's wrong, and it won't be tolerated. This is a non-bullying zone tonight. Um, we're going to, well, that goes for everybody. This, this is, we're a great community. We should be having these discussions in a civil manner and be respectful of everybody. We don't all agree, but if we do it that way, we'll get to a good place on this thing, wherever we get. Um, I got it. We're going to keep everyone strict three-minute time limit. Now, last, last meeting, there was an interesting tactic, sort of a, a but the, once it come from the professional wrestling, it was a tag team uh, kind of tactic, which was pretty interesting. Uh, we're not going to allow any tag teaming tonight or any disruptive practices or to try to monopolize or prevent others from being heard. So we're going to go individually. You'll get your time and, and uh, no tag teaming tonight. The meeting is being taped. So when you're, when you're recognized, please come to the, uh, to the mic here and state your name and your address so it's all for the record and, and it will be taped. And uh, you should be mic pretty good so everybody can, can hear you. We're not making any final decisions tonight. As to scheduling of any other additional public hearing on this matter, we'll play it by ear, depending on various factors, including how tonight goes um, and others which may not even be clear to any of us yet. So, um, you know, this is sort of an ongoing process here. So thanks everybody, if we can follow along, I think everybody will be heard. and. It'll be a really good, productive meeting tonight, and we're really looking forward to hearing from everybody. Um, I think, uh, again, just to, to open up here, uh, Patty, I think if you'll just take a couple of minutes, there are, I think, some things you want to show that maybe you haven't shown before. Um, I'm not talking. You're not talking, Patty. You're going to be pushing the buttons. <laughs> but the developer's representative will speak for a few minutes here just to get started, and then we'll start taking public uh, input in the groupings that I outline. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, trustees. My name is Linda Whitehead. I'm a partner in the firm of McCullough, Goldberger, and Stout, here representing BRB Contracting, LLC. Is that better? No. Is it not on? No, it's on. It's, just, it's, it's the lavalier. Is that better? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, now that I have to have a mic in my hand. Um, we have our entire development team here this evening in case there's any questions that come up that the board would like us to answer. Um, as the mayor indicated, this is the continued public hearing for site plan approval for the adaptive reuse of the former Oceana Publishing Building for a new mixed-use building with up to 22, that number has come down, um, 22 fully accessible residential units, 28 new off-street parking spaces, retail space on the ground floor of the existing building facing Maine, um, and related amenities. We did make a full presentation at the last meeting, so we're just going to briefly address a few things tonight. 
Um, as we've stated, the project will respect the history of the property while investing in the downtown with a transit-oriented development as strongly encouraged by the vision plan and your zoning ordinance. Um, the mayor made a comment about the AHRB indicating there's still work to be done, and that's actually um, important in the context of one of the comments from the last meeting. The facade details, the details of the historic renovation, those are all things that the AHRB will be reviewing prior to the issuance of any building permit. So that's the real part of the work that still has to be done is what's the facade going to look like, what are the details of the historic renovation, although the planning board has recommended certain parameters for that. Um, the plan went through many months of review before the planning board and the AHRB, six public hearings, extra work sessions, four AHRB meetings, and numerous revisions to building massing and height. Both the planning board and the AHRB have endorsed the plan that we presented at the last meeting. The planning board's recommendation, which the mayor referred to, and a detailed memo provided by the village's consulting planner conclude after much work and study that the project is an important and highly desirable project for the village. Um, we encourage you all to read um, both the planning board recommendation and the January 22nd memo from Dwight Douglas, your consulting planner, as it provides a good analysis of the re review that the planning board undertook. What we're going to do for you now is give you a little bit of that background in history and then present you with another alternative plan um, that was prepared based on comments that we heard at the last meeting. So the original plan that was presented to the planning board, uh, which Patty's going to put up in a moment, um, was 32 units. It had virtually no setbacks on Palisade Street, had a very large roof deck. We're going to show you two views of each of these. Um, from the park looking up to the corner and then looking back on Palisade showing the house next door and the church across the street. This was modified through the process with the planning board and the AHRB to what we refer to as the center tower design. Um, this reduced the roof, stepped back portions of the addition on top of the existing warehouse and was intended generally to reduce the impact on the street. At the request of the planning board and AHRB, again, after much work, working with the applicant's architect and team, we modified that to what was known as the corner tower design. This is the plan which was recommended and endorsed by the planning board and the AHRB, as well as your consultant planner, and which we presented at the last meeting. Each iteration was intended to reduce the massing and the impact of the building through stepping back the upper floors and eliminating the large roof from the original plan. Uh, the planning board references these steps in its recommendation. It also states that while the building is higher than others on Palisade Streets, the higher floors are set back to reduce the impacts on the neighboring homes and the church. The planning board stated that they felt this building provides transition from Main Street around Chestnut and down to Palisades. The planning board also reviewed what was called an as of right building. This is discussed in your consulting uh, planner's memo. This was just a massing plan and what this represents is what could be built under the current zoning um, if the warehouse building were to be removed and a new building built there. It's a building that would contain eight units it complies with all of the setback and height requirements of the code based upon the sliding scale provisions of your code. With this plan, only eight to 10 at-grade parking spaces would be provided and only for this new building as no parking is required for the existing Oceana building under your code. The facade improvements to the Oceana building would also be limited under this plan as it doesn't have the same level of economic return. The planning board did not look favorably at this option, as is discussed in the planner's memo, um, and we really think it's not the best way to deal with this site as a whole, um, and it is one single lot. Next, based upon the comments that we heard from the last public hearing, a lot of which related to the view of that corner tower as you come up Palisade, um, we prepared another alternative design which eliminates the corner tower. It takes a floor off of the corner and softens the appearance of the corner by stepping back the addition. Again, the corner tower was an element requested by the planning board and the AHRB. 
but we heard the comments at the last meeting a few weeks ago, and we've provided this alternative as a way to soften that corner. The top floor, and we did we have some extra views on this one as well, Patty? Um, the top floor on this plan is set back substantially in all areas, except for a small portion on the Chestnut Street frontage where it relates to the existing building and the connection between the two. So you can see that it steps back, it's set back further at each level, um, and even further as you go up to the top level, which is set back even further um, from Palisades. We're hoping that this addresses some of the comments and concerns. Um, and with that, that's really um, all we had to present for this evening. We'd be happy to answer any questions um, that the board may wish us to answer, um, or we will um, address you again at the end, assuming we get through all the public comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll start with group one. Anybody who was at the last meeting uh, but didn't get a chance to speak, um, that's, we'll get through to you first as a priority. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so you'll come up here, you're, you'll be the uh, test case here, and uh, state your name and your address. And again, please, if everybody can keep their comments to three minutes, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Susan Richmond, and I live at 177 Palisade Avenue. And uh, right after college, my husband and I moved up to Dobbs Ferry. So you do the math, it's been like 30 plus years. And we first lived on Draper Lane when they were rentals. And then when it was time that, uh, you know, we thought about buying a house, we never even looked outside of Dobbs Ferry because we really loved it. You know, it was charming and um, we loved the river and everything. So I'm actually in support of this building. And the reason is because it does sadden me that Dobbs Ferry, the downtown, isn't as vital as it used to be for many, many years. It was much more vital. So I think it would bring um, some excitement. I think it would bring street traffic and a revitalization to downtown. And I do think actually that while the taxes on Palisade Avenue, my daughter's a junior, so after she graduates high school, you know, we're thinking, well, where do we go now to reduce our expenses? I do think that's an opportunity for empty nesters to stay in town. And I think there was a young woman last meeting um, and I felt for her that, you know, it would be nice to have some place that she could actually buy in Dobbs. So I think it could be for the young people. I don't think that it's the likely place where, you know, if you have $600,000, you're going to be buying a, a co-op on the Main Street. I think you're going to be buying a house. So I think it provides a very unique advantage. So that's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Ed. Uh, Ed Hennessy, Bellwood Avenue. Can you hear me all right? Ed Hennessy, Bellwood Avenue. I'm a property owner on Palisade Street, and more importantly, I'm a member of the Sacred Heart Our Lady of Pompeii Parish, which I have major concerns of. But, uh, like most other people, I support the revitalization or the rebuilding of the Oceana building completely. What I'm concerned about is the back portion of the building that I think it is out of scale for the Palisade Street neighborhood uh, and the character of the neighborhood. Although I got to say this most recent rendition is the best one I've seen yet because it steps it back even further. The board has been asked to and given the right to give them a height waiver. And depending on whose numbers you use, that height waiver can be as much as double what the code calls for currently. I have a concern of two, twofold. Number one, the height waiver itself You'd be setting a precedent if you actually gave a waiver for something that's double what the code calls for, which could come back in the future and cause a problem. I also have a, a problem with the, the height itself. When you come out of Pompeii Church, you're looking at the size of a building that's quite large. You know, maybe with the latest rendition, it'll be a little different and, and better. I'm not really certain. A second problem I see is that they had the uh, parking garage entrance and exit on Palisade Street 
They noted that there'd be a loss of maybe two, possibly three parking spaces. I'm not too sure if that would be actually correct, if what you'd lose. But any loss of parking spaces on that street is going to cause a problem with the church. And the fact that on Sundays or any day they have a social event or for religious ed, uh, weddings, any occasion on it is still a parking issue. But it's it can be, you know, let's say corrected, but it, people can live around it. Putting that across the street from it would cause a, a serious issue. And a number of people, a lot of people, spent more than two years trying to keep Pompeii Church open when the Archdiocese had plans of uh, closing it as part of their reconsolidation of parishes. Uh, I think if that would be allowed to be done over there, it would cause a problem with the, the turnout for Mass. Right now on Sunday Masses, the 10.15 is generally at capacity and standing room only. The 5 o'clock at night is pretty close to that most Sundays as it is now, which is very good. And that was one of the convincing arguments to the Archdiocese that it was a viable pro parish not to close it. On Chestnut Street, there currently is at least 30 some odd feet of uh, non-parking where they have the delivery entrances to both the, the current building and the, uh, the garage in the back. If they can remodify that and put the entrance and, and exit on, on that street, and perhaps move some of the parking spaces, you wouldn't really lose any parking spaces because that, that, that foot frontage is there. Uh, so again, you know, the, the people move to this village because they like the village, they like this, the, the way the village is. And part of that is, is not only our schools, but also we have a religious community, we have a tight-knit community, and I hate to see Pompeii, which we spend so much time trying to keep open, to have a problem caused by a parking issue that could actually end up closing it. I would really hate to see that. And thank you for your time. I guess thank I have my three you. minutes up. Okay, group uh, one, Neil. Mayor uh, trustees, um, I'd like to first of all say that um, my comments are about process. Oh, okay. Neil, could you say your I'm name? Sorry. Address? Neil Whitehouse, 26 Hatch Terrace. Um, my comments are about process. They're short. Um, but before I go there, I was impressed by the different iterations of this as it has evolved. There's no question it has improved. And um, my first thought is that one or two more rounds of that kind of improvement could well get it to a place where I would feel comfortable with that mass of building being there. With that said, uh, this is a letter I, I wrote to the board. I want to read into the record. I respectfully request the Board of Trustees not attempt to exercise waiver powers pursuant to Village Code Section 300-52E with regard to the current proposal for 75 Main Street. Four points. First, the idea to use waiver power is highly questionable and suspect. There will inevitably be expensive litigation against the village if this process proceeds as it is currently being attempted. And the village does not, this administration has not had good record with recent litigations. The rationale for this waiver strategy appears to be that the administration understands that the proposal cannot be approved through the proper legal process. Hence, rather than substantial modifications to the pro proposal, we have this attempt at an end run on the process. This issue raises questions regarding the legality of waivers previously given, which approvals that incorporated waivers may well have to be revisited. Second, while there is inherent merit in any credible proposal to bring the Oceana building back to life, to discard critical aspects of the code, the approvals process, and the vision plan to accommodate the height and mass of this proposed building cannot be justified. Third, the fear argument has no merits. The fear argument is that this entire plan, if this entire plan is not approved as proposed, the developer will abandon it and the Oceana building will never be restored, so the village should quickly approve this before our savior disappears. However, since the Mayor won approval of the Rivertown Square, Dobbs Ferry has been in play, we are, and we are surrounded by building sites as proof of this. This site is now too attractive a commercial prospect to remain neglected for much longer. If this developer cannot produce a plan that fits into the village and can be approved by the proper process, as Dobbs Ferry is now in play, there is an excellent potential another will come along. Here in Dobbs Ferry, we choose not to respond to fear. 
Fourth and finally, this is a shining example of why the approvals process has to be restructured in line with the detailed proposal I first submitted in May 2015. That proposal would make it so no application could go before the Board of Trustees unless it had first been approved by the Architectural and Historical Re Review Board and the Planning Board. Had it been adopted, we would not be having this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Okay, we're staying with uh, Group 1. Yes, sir. Again, group one is anyone who was at the last meeting but didn't get a chance to speak. Brandon Hall, 117 Main Street. Uh, I personally am in uh, agreement with this proposal, uh, and I would like to actually purchase one of these units once they're available for buying. Um, I'm interested in purchasing a building on Main Street, and uh, the entire process of purchasing and renovating the building, which uh, can seem quite daunting it sometimes. Uh, the only process or the only step in that process that scares me isn't the, the acquisition of money or the nuts and bolts of getting the construction work done. Uh, the part of the process that scares me is uh, the approval process. And I have seen uh, a number of buildings in town that need a tremendous amount of attention. Uh, I've been in these buildings, I've inspected them, uh, structurally and uh, the mechanicals of the building uh, are in disrepair and uh, if, they're, if attention isn't given to them it's going to be catastrophic. So th this particular building that I'm interested in, the only reason that I'm interested in it is because it has an approval for renovations. Uh, if it didn't have that I wouldn't even consider it and it, it, it seems like this angry mob of people uh, that uh, don't want any change in the community are really scaring a, a lot of uh, well-intended uh, developers away. So I think that uh, you know a reasonable approach has to be taken. Uh, I think that uh, you know the adaptation of this building is appropriate, uh, and and I'm in full support of it. Thank you, sir. You spoke at the last. You spoke yeah, the last you, time, Ruth. I yes, sir. Uh, you can go I, on the... I would like to respond to this gentleman because I think these buildings can be repacked. Uh, Klaus Whitney, Dobbsbury. Um, a couple of comments I want to make. I mean, I've been in this town for 23 years. And first of all, I want to address this thing about everybody acting like the millennials are the saviors. My opinion is millennials are not going to come to Docks Ferry because we don't have bars. We don't have a nightlife here. I have two kids that are 22 and 20. They're seeking out places where you can go out, have a good time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The people who are going to come and live here are people who want to use their schools. Who know it's a family life. So this thing about empty nesters and millennials, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. And I think everything should be based on, I'm going to have families here with children, number one. Number two, I don't think most of the people, and I hope I don't speak for everybody, are against redevelopment downtown. That's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about a vision plan, and yeah, okay, the vision plan says, let's do this, let's do that. But I don't think part of the vision plan is to give these enormous variances to double, triple buildings, to, to increase the height. If, if that is the vision plan, then it should have been written into the vision plan. And if it's that what you want, then let's redo the vision plan. Because that's not the vision I have for Dubs Ferry. Okay, I feel like I have vested 23 years, 23 years here, I've paid taxes, I have shopped here, I've contributed to this community. And for some of you who has not contributed to come here, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, to push us aside here, no, I'm not going to take it sitting down, okay? So it is not about redeveloping downtown, it's how we do it. And I agree, we're setting a dangerous precedent because that becomes the new benchmark for the downtown. Every time I come to these meetings, it's the biggest building that's the benchmark. And the next project is going to use this building and say, now we're going to go 50% bigger than that building. And now we're going to give 50-foot variances. And I see what's going to happen. And we're going to be Dobbs Ferry on the Yonkers. Thank you. Yes, thank you.
I'm Peggy Blizzard from 12 Chestnut Street. That means that we live in the downtown. Um, I'm really very, very nervous about this use of waivers, and I support everything that's been said so far. It's very, very dangerous to use waivers because it does set a benchmark, and what it does, in effect, is completely wipe out our zoning code. There will be no zoning code effectively if you allow waivers. Um, I think, from what I have read, a waiver is supposed to be used for a small thing. For example, if a code says you're supposed to have so many trees around your property, or if you're supposed to have a fence around the development, and let's say that fence or those trees blocks the view of oncoming traffic, then the health, safety, and welfare of the public is at risk. And that, in that case, you could waive those trees or that fence. But there's no way on earth you can say that going from 30 feet to 60 feet is in our best interest. You just can't convince us of that. Now, all of the, I've got one more point to make um, about the garage. The garage is going to have two entrances. Inside, there will not be a connection between the two floors. This guy said that. Um, you're going to enter one floor from Chestnut Street. You're going to enter the other from Palisade Street. It's going to be like this. So you're going to lose a total of roughly eight parking spaces. An entrance to the garage will be a roughly, not quite, but roughly two parking spaces. Then you've got to have a parking space on either side so you won't have a wreck coming and going. So that's eight parking spaces. Now, Larry had a discussion with Patty who said that, uh, oh, those aren't legal parking spaces anyway. That's not the issue. You have a certain amount of land on a road and it can be divided up into so many parking spaces. You can decide how many you want to have. So however many you could have on either one of those streets, you're going to lose four on Chestnut and you're going to lose four on Palisade Street. That's eight parking spaces you're going to lose. Now inside the thing you're supposed to have, you're going to have 24 parking spaces. So if you take the eight away, that means you're going to have really 16 usable spaces because you're going to lose the spaces you would have had on the street. So once again, I want to stress, please, really think seriously about this waiver thing because it just, it's not a good idea at all. And 30 feet is enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, Larry? How many more do we have to go for a group one? Okay, we'll get to all you. Thank you very much. Before I talk about my views on the oh, project... Oh, Larry, your name and address? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Larry Taylor, Buena Vista Drive in Dobbs Ferry. Um, before I talk about my views on the project, I just want to take one second. Uh, the, the board has been criticized a lot in the last meeting and even so far in this meeting. Um, I'd like to compliment them on the extent that they've gone to with this process. And I think everybody in this room needs to recognize this is a group of people who spend hundreds of hours uh, doing their best effort to do what they believe is right for this community and so we should be grateful for their efforts whichever way they vote uh, on this project. Uh, I've done tremendous report applause. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to living in Dobbs Ferry uh, for 15 years and the River Towns for over 20 I uh, have been involved in some efforts over the years at Downtown Improvement uh, Committee and most recently working with some of the business owners locally uh, to reinvigorate start up a Chamber of Commerce. The downtown and the neighborhood uh, where we work, shop, where we eat out, where we enjoy being part of a community is very, very important to me. I'm in favor of this project and I'm in favor for a number of reasons. Number one, I think having strong, a strong residential component to our downtown is critical to maintaining a vibrant business community. This is a project that's going to attract 24, 22, 20, uh, I don't know exactly how many households it'll end up with, but who want to live, work, shop, eat out, walk around, spend their time and their money in Dobbs Ferry. And all of us benefit from the ability for businesses to start and to continue to prosper. Number two, this is, I believe, a very good financial decision for the village. Dobbs Ferry has high taxes. Everyone in this room, assuming that you're a homeowner, knows that. 
and uh, they're not going in the right direction and won't unless we find ways to increase the tax base in this village. And it's important to think about good development in ways that adds to our tax base. Number three, this is a project, and I, I hear the objections about the waiver. There's often compromise and, and, and things that need to be done, but as I understand this process, both the ARB and the planning board have viewed this project favorably, and that's something that we should take into account. Uh, number four, unlike uh, some of the other speakers, I think we do need to consider the alternatives here. Um, one alternative is that the building continues to be vacant. That building has been essentially dormant for at least five years and could continue on that path for a longer period of time. In addition, as has been demonstrated under the existing village code, a much more detrimental set of projects could be put together uh, under the existing zoning for that building. So I think it is important that we consider the alternatives. Uh, there have been a number of other comments uh, that I agree with. I think this is an, an environmentally sound plant piece of planning in terms of the fact that these people are going to be walking more than the average resident of Dobbs instead of using their cars. And I think this is, somebody said, a LEED certified yeah. building, which is also good. Thank you very much. Okay, group one, we're still with group one. Nicole. Nicole Sullivan, 204 Ashford Avenue, Dobbs Ferry. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of points to the letter that I had sent to the mayor and the board today. I'm not going to reiterate it, but a significant concern that I have, and I had this issue with the school district last year about class size, is the number of students that are going to be coming into our district with not only 75 mean, but the cumulative effect of all the new developments. And I know that they talk about just a few students coming in, but last night at the meeting on the Jefferson project, they talked about, I have to read my notes, the Boulder Ridge project in Ardsley, and they had estimated that it would be about 20 to 25 students in the school, and it turned out to be 125 students. And if the tax base increase from this project is about, I don't know, I think $140,000, and the average cost per student is 24 and change, so all we would need is about six students into these communities to create, into the 75 main, um, to create an issue for us. And I think that's likely considering the New York Times highlighted the benefits to living in Dobbs Ferry as a river town because of our IB program. The fact that they've expanded the IB to the middle years program, that's very unique in the river towns. Actually, pretty much in Westchester, there's very few IB schools. It's one of the things that attracted us from the city to Dobbs Ferry. I mean, I researched a lot of things, but the most important thing I researched was the schools, and that was one of the deciding factors for us. And parking at the train station, which is becoming a problem. <laughs> Um, anyway, I also am concerned about the process with the, the waiver issue here. Um, I think it, it does do an end run around the zoning code when it's being used to grant such a substantial uh, variance and create such a dissimilar property um, in the MDR2 zone. Um, this, the developer articulated at the January 12, 2016 meeting basically um, that we've been guided down this way by the village to go to the waiver route and so therefore we should be allowed to get the waivers and that kind of reasoning scares me it scares me about the process and i think that there's been a growing concern about the process in general and a distrust of um, the process then that kind of language creates it and it and it raises um, a few flags they seem to have reiterated that in their january 20th 2016 letter um, to the, the board, and what I didn't see in that letter or here at the last hearing or this hearing is how this design um, needs a waiver because it's necessary to protect the public health, safety, or the general welfare of our village. And what they did cite to in support of their position is a fourth department case, the matter of Lockport, where the fourth department appellate division in the New York court state system approved the use of waivers in that community, but what they left out of their letter is that the code there only allowed waivers when it was extremely difficult for the project to strictly conform with the town code. And that involved um, they couldn't have parking and have their plan, uh, site plan approved. And so they had granted the waiver, but the court specifically noted that they found the extreme difficult, and this is a quote, the extreme difficulty standard is capable of a reasonable application and is sufficient to limit and define the board's discretionary power. I just don't see that same thing, sorry, that same thing here. 
Um, all I keep hearing about is that it just won't be economically feasible for the developer to develop it if this, this plan isn't approved. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. Don Vitagliano, 81 Grandview Avenue with Ups Ferry. We have three major ongoing construction projects at Ups Ferry, 2 Astrid Avenue, 66, 68 Main Street, and the Tarracone lot. I don't know what the exact address is. Uh, they stopped the work at 66, 68 Main Street because they undermined the neighboring foundation to the building. My question to you guys is that at the last meeting, I was out in the hall and I heard the building's in disrepair. Is this building going to withstand any additional construction to it? What are the guarantees that, that there's not just something that's going to happen that's going to undermine or create a problem with this building? The process for contractors coming in and doing work in our community, who ideas these contractors that come in and do the work? They undermine the foundation to the building at 68, 66. Understandably, these things happen in construction. I've been in construction for 30 years. What are the bond situations for people to come in and do these contract, do these projects in the community? Who oversees that? I know we have a code enforcer. I know we have a building inspector. This is our community. And contrary to the gentleman said that we're a mob earlier today, we're not a mob. We're concerned citizens about our community. We're not a mob of people. We come here. We pay taxes. We live here. We're not a mob. That's number one. And I'm going to make another comment you made, Mr. Gannett, about bullying. I've seen meetings where you bullied Vicki Jones, Hubert Harry, and other citizens that come before the board. You okay, hear, Donnie, you, 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 you hear, you hear, you hear, it's not personal, bullying. it's not personal. No, it is. You yeah. made the question about bullying. Well, I, I'm just adding that you don't. Yeah. What are we going to do to building. make okay. sure stick with that this building is going to be constructed safely? Okay? We have an ongoing project at 2 Street Avenue that's been there for 10 years, not complete. We, we under, you started construction on two other projects in the community. One undermined the building's foundation next door. What are the guarantees that this building, and they said it at the last meeting, it was in the hall, the integrity of the building is in disrepair. So I would like to hear that question. Yes. No, sir. Giuliano, 66 Main Street. Nobody, no one is undermining anybody's property next door. So let's get the information straight. These rumors and innuendos are totally false. You guys are the gang. The, what's happening at 66 Main Street is we found sand and we are in decreasing the size of the basement. Sir, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're, think, we're, uh, we need to clear, we need to clear the area. Nothing to do with this okay. building. So the, the 66 Main Street the is, here, okay. is, is, is moving forward for reasons you guys have no clue, number one. Number two, I waited, and all the developers have waited for years for something to happen in this town. The code changes. The code was changed. The new vision plan was enact, enacted. And we have the same cast of characters here who say oh, we're disrupting water, uh, river views. We're destroying the downtown. I am for this project because this is a unique piece of property that several developers have tried in the past to build, but were scared off, were denied for whatever reason. Okay, this one here does not, will not set a precedent in terms of heights, in terms of this. What other properties will have 16, 18, 20 parking spaces? Okay, this is basically the hub of the downtown that needs to be revitalized. Do we want Main Street to turn into a slum? That's what's going to happen because we talk about low income, low income, affordable housing. A whole of Main Street is affordable and low income. These houses, are, these buildings are deteriorating. They're, they're falling apart. Do we want this to fall apart? Do we, what do we want to do here? 
Main Street needs to be revitalized. These storefronts, many of them are empty. Many of them are barely surviving. So let's get it together here. This is a beautiful project that needs to move it forward. And if we want other people to develop and to further enhance the down, downtown. I am not a greedy developer. I was raised in this town. I have family. I have relatives in this town. So for people to just throw out these innuendos, oh, these greedy builders, they, to make it vi economically viable, it's a lot of farce. There are too many people here who don't want anything to happen. They just want further decay of Main Street. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, we're sticking with group three here. Um, Group one. Oh, sorry, I'm group one. Company head. Yeah, sir, you. Hi, Nick Anderson, 38 Oliphant Avenue. As I said before, I'm the youngest person here, probably. Thank you, Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, I grew up in this town. I love this town. I still live in it. I only moved away for out of state school for a semester or two. Um, I want to comment on a couple things. I heard that this was supposed to be built for millennials to start moving into the town. If state-of-the-art buildings are going to be made in this town, which I don't disagree with necessarily because I do believe that downtown should be revitalized. Um, downtown scene is great for millennials. State-of-the-art building that has only 22 units now will not be affordable for my generation. I'm 22, I know I can't afford it, and I know people that are 30, 32 that can't afford it. I heard a comment on um, loading zones for businesses and working with um, scheduling times for those distributors to drop off to businesses. Virtually impossible. I work at a restaurant in Hastings, and uh, that's not up to the town. That's up to the distributors, and a lot of beer distributors, food distributors nowadays, are uh, putting stricter time restraints on days and hours that they uh, deliver to businesses. So I disagree with a lot, and I hope that the downtown is revitalized, but properly. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Yes, sir. Uh, how many more left for the uh, group one? Just a few over here. Okay, four, we're getting there. Five. Good evening, Mayor and members of the board. Bob McLaughlin, Chair of the Citizens Budget Committee. I'd like to, uh, Dave Oaks of the Budget Committee spoke about the financials for this project at the last meeting, did a terrific job. I mean, when you look at the financials, when the committee looked at them, it's hard to argue against this project. I mean, we're almost doubling the tax base for the same footprint, keeping the same historical design, on-site parking, uh, you know, walking to the shops, schools, uh, the supermarket, houses of worship, the train station. There's a, a tremendous amount of benefits. Now, I understand from my fellow neighbors here and, and residents, there are a lot of concerns, and I think they'll be addressed. But I trust the village officials, and I trust the people on the planning board and the architectural review board. We have a lot of good volunteers that really take an interest in doing the right thing. Uh, Larry, who came up before and did a wonderful job, stole a lot of my thunder in talking about the taxes in the village and how high the taxes are. So if I may just for a second talk about that. You know, in this area of New York, we're almost 50% more that we pay in taxes, real estate taxes, than uh, villages and towns and municipalities and other areas. We have a tax cap that's been forced down and mandates from the state. Our current tax cap is 1.43%. The new tax cap, we met on Monday night the budget committee with you know, the village staff about this. The new tax cap is down to 0.57%. I'd just like to say, I mean, I've been involved for over 20 years uh, in the village volunteering. I've been, I think since the budget committee started, I've been chair of the committee. It's been about seven years, appointed by the previous administration and supported by this administration. It's completely nonpartisan. We look at things from a 
a purely financial point of view. Uh, and we try to be fair. We want, you know, it, it's good to see so many people turn out interested in the village. Uh, we have been able to stay under the, tap, the cap for the last five years. It's going to become more difficult. People do not, you know, I haven't had, I guess in the last two weeks, I've had the most calls I ever had in volunteering for the village. And that's because people started to receive their rebate checks. And they were substantial. And that's great. And that only happens because the mayor and the board of trustees and the village staff work very hard to keep the taxes down. And I think we should do it. Thank you. They take a lot of criticism, but they should. Uh, and we will follow through from a budget committee point of view as the project moves forward. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, uh, Steve. Time to wasting. Uh, I'm going to do the speed dating version of this. I'll hand it out. Uh, thanks for your patience, for everyone's patience and attention. There is a Steve Tilly, uh, Ogden Park. I pay taxes on two properties. There is a false sense of polarization around and about that gets in the way of patient, rational discussion that ought to attend this application and every land use. Discussion. Characterization of Patty Steinschneider as the devil incarnate, or of a small group of people who are opposed to any project, shed more heat than light and are unproductive. There is spirited discussion and important issues at stake. Intense discussion and controversy are sometimes a symptom of overreach. I know there is some general agreement on needed code changes that might address some of this, but I believe there has been, in more than one proposal, a misapplication of principles I believe in and practice elsewhere, including Westchester downtowns and the Bronx, with great care and no controversy. Rather than false polarization, let's talk about a happier sister proposal that looks like this. One, adaptive reuse of the big building. Most of the benefits, units, tax revenue, visual enhancements in the current proposal flow from this reuse of this structure. Two, full tax credit qualifying rehabilitation. This means holistic retention of historic elements, not cherry picking here and there and reconstructing facsimiles. The tax credits provide a 20% financial bonus that can make a big difference. Two, three, demolition of the warehouse may surprise some people. Four, a beautiful block of housing down to street level facing Our Lady of Pompeii. No garage entrance facing weddings, funerals, and religious education events. Uh, an elevator only glazed shaft serving the building, blocking fewer views from the old building and providing access to the housing across a landscape, green roof, over parking, housed in between the building and the housing, How, parking entrance only from Chestnut. All of this meeting height requirements. Uh, and a couple of remaining non-compliant area variances which would likely be granted by the ZBA. This isn't my idea. It comes from a developer who has made an offer based on this scenario. It, it necessarily yields a lower sale price, but still a nice payday for the owner. Finally, no waivers. Waivers are unwise and overreach, and I believe after consultation with the Department of State, a distortion of the underlying state village law. And someone's mentioned Lockport smart growth versus the city of Lockport, the case cited by counsel for the applicant. Lockport smart growth was actually Walmart who needed one variance for the big box store. And again, the facts are different. The code test was completely different. And relief was for extreme difficulties. So OK, I'm, I'm hustling. It's, give me a break. Uh, Dobbs has a problem with its waiver use thus far. Last time, Dwight Douglas used as an example the waiver of required ground floor commercial use for 81 Main. That's a use variance. 
which Darius later said could not be granted for the unit count in the MDR 2's parcel here. I agree with Darius, but that means 81 Main, a good reuse of the bank, uh, has a defective approval and should go back to the, CB, the ZBA. A block away on Broadway, another presumably worthwhile application for housing is being sent to the ZBA for variances. Why is that? The use of waivers, especially when applied to a large number of variances with significant impact for a highly visible project, looks like an arbitrary process that calls into a question. Steve, I, I've got to stop you. I'm letting you go for a long time here. So I think you submitted this letter to the board. I haven't as yet. part of the record. I, I, I'm, I'm almost you, there. Can you, you wrap it up? What, you Thanks. Know, 20 seconds? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, uh, arbitrary that calls into question the reason for having zoning at all since it can be suspended virtually at will. That's why Rob Lane voted against the project. I concur. Thinking about the experiment we are subjects in, 49 units underway are proposed within a couple of blocks, 202 in Rivertown Square plus retail, 66 units at Sawmill Lofts, and another 272 at the Jefferson. We have no idea really about the impacts of many hundreds of new cars on our road network or downtown. Time for a pause. Thank you, Steve. Nick. Okay, we have a, how many more left for uh, General, General Mayor? Two back there. Okay. <clears throat> lower this. Uh, Nick Capuano, 60 Lafergie. Um, we've, heard, we've heard a lot tonight, and I think the one thing that's been said by people, whether in favor of the project or not, is that the downtown area needs needs some work and if the buildings in the downtown area whether it's the facade the structure of the building systems are in a state of disrepair that's not a zoning issue that's not a planning board issue that's a building department issue and it should be addressed if somebody in this village is living in an unsafe environment an unheated environment fix it we don't have to come here on a thursday night to talk about it and it sounds like there's a lot of people here uh, who either live in it or know it's out there so you can't ignore it anymore. Okay. The other thing I wanted to say is I've been in a few of the presentations and I've seen different pictures of uh, the Oceana building. And I know it's called 75 Main Street, but this is really a Palisade Street project. Nobody's complaining other than maybe the facade. What's going to happen with that building? This is all about Palisade Street and a church that was built in the early 1920s. And if you look at the old pictures, that building ran all the way down the block, okay, going back to the 1880s or whatever it was. Right before or around when that church was built, the back half of that's been locked off. It has a separate zoning for a reason. It is not downtown business, okay? It's a residential street. And it's my understanding that the reason this wasn't referred to the zoning board, okay, was because it was known they couldn't lawfully approve it. So to lean on waivers when we know, it was said last, it was said two weeks ago that it was a real question whether or not the zoning board could even approve this project, okay? I, is anybody disagreeing with that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's different. It's different. Just, well, it's not conforming as it is right now. I, I understand that, but if you're gonna do th this amount, you can't rely on that non-conforming to, to do what you want. So the point is to use a waiver where you know the zoning board would have great difficulty approving it and withstanding a challenge, wherever it may come from. It's not really the purpose, and this might be a question for Darius, but it seems like the, the, the village code, okay, is based on an enabling statute um, in the village law, the state village law. Is that 725? Yes. Yeah. A, okay. Okay, and when I look at the waiver language there, and I'm not a land use guy, so you could certainly correct me, and uh, that's fine. When you look at the language in 300-52E, it really doesn't mesh with the village law. For one, there's a reasonable standard in the state village law that's found nowhere in our code, okay? It has to be when reasonable. And to say that planning board or any board can do whatever it wants um, if it finds in its sole discretion that it promotes the health, safety, and general welfare is different 
than the wording in the enabling statute, which says you can only grant a waiver where what you're, the requirements you're, wa you're waiving is not requisite to health, safety, or general welfare. And that's not the case here on a whole host of fronts for parking, setbacks, height, and everything else. So this really has to be looked at, and that's all I want to say. Thank, Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Uh, Freddie? Freddie? Good evening. My name is Fred Kearns, 126 Palisade Street. I've lived in a village for 72 years. Now, many large-scale developments have been built over the years under strict code enforcement. To allow these developers waivers goes against the codes set in place by myself and other professionals who work tirelessly to draw up these codes for the safety and protection of the residents of Dobbs Ferry. For the Planning Board and Architectural Review Board to allow these variances to go to a vote before the Board of Trustees, it not only is a slap in the face to those of us who volunteered our time to set them in place, this is still a small village along the Hudson, and that is what the residents, old and new, would like to keep. If the Board of Trustees approved these waivers, it would definitely impact the quality of life for the residents of Dobbs Ferry in a negative way. Not to mention the impact it'll have on our schools, fire department, DPW department, and police department. Also, traffic and parking, which already is a problem in this neighborhood, will be a nightmare. Let's enforce the codes instead of circumventing them. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. John? Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is John Brosey. I live at 152 Broadway in Dobbs Ferry. And uh, <clears throat> I'm here tonight to just ask you to really think uh, a lot more carefully before you use this waiver power. I think focusing on the merits of the project is really, you know, with respect, <laughs> due respect to all the people that have spoken about it, is really kind of the wrong question to be asking. Um, I think the question to ask is, is this an appropriate use of the waiver power. And I've written a letter to the board, I hope you've all read it, um, where I detail you know, why I think it is not in this case. Um, I'll summarize it just very quickly here at a high level because I want to ask the board a couple of questions. Um, you know, the summary of my letter is that I think it, it's inappropriate to use the waiver power here because it's unusual, possibly unprecedented, to grant this sort of a substantial waiver using this power. Um, I don't think it's supported by the evidence the uh, code requires that it be shown that this project or plan be as good as or better than one that would be in strict compliance with the code. I don't think that's been shown at all. Um, and also, I think it'd be a, a real mistake because I think it sets a very dangerous precedent. Um, it undermines the integrity of the code. And I, you know, when I when I bought my house, you know, I relied on what the code said. And, and if other people are buying properties here, and you say, hey, you know. Really, the code just depends upon the whim of whoever happens to be on the board at any particular time. You know, why would I be willing to invest in property in, in Dobbs Ferry if I can't rely on what the law says? Um, so that's, that's number one. And, and number, the second point I'd like to ask, and this is going to involve a couple questions to the board. Um, you know, when, you, when you think about you know, doing this sort of extraordinary power here, using this extraordinary power, it gets people to talking. And there's, quite frankly, a lot of rumors out there. And they, these are rumors, and, I, and I'm going to ask these questions not to accuse people, but I really think it's in your interest and the interest of democracy to clear up some of these things that have been going around. Um, and number one is, you know, it has been said 
And some of you guys here on the board have a personal relationship with the owner of the building who wants to sell it. And, you know, that's not a crime in and of itself. We're a small town. Um, but I, I would like to know, if that's the case, um, for you to talk about that and say, you know, why isn't that biasing me here? And why is it appropriate for me to exercise this extraordinary power when I may have a personal relationship with the owner? Maybe you don't. I don't know. This is just what I've heard. Um, the second thing is I've also heard that, that some members of the board have expressed interest in actually living in this building. And again, it's, it's pure rumor. It may be completely untrue. But I'd like you, you know, I, I would ask you to say whether that's true or not. You know, are you interested in living there? Have you had any discussions with the owner about living there? Because if, that's, if someone from the board ends up moving in there, you know, a few months after it's built, after exercising this waiver, I think that would look, it would look pretty bad. Um, and so I ask these with respect. Again, it may, may be completely untrue, but I, but I would, I think it's in everyone's interest to clear up a couple of these things. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Board. Yes, Teresa. Hi, Teresa Ferraro. Uh, I live in Dobbs Ferry of Palisade Street, uh, Palisade Avenue, 199 Palisade Avenue. I would like to live on Palisade Street. Um, I wasn't going to speak because I am one of the realtors, along with my husband, that put this project together, uh, this team of Bart and uh, Pod and Patty Steinschneider. Uh, my husband and I have lived here for 14 years, and um, We've been looking at that building for a long time. We brought in a buyer in 2006, and he, he ran from the, from the project. It uh, didn't make sense for him. 2008, we all know what happened. Um, we came from the city. We believe strongly in public education. So when we looked at this, and we did find a buyer for this, for this project, it wasn't even on the market. We sought it out just out of love for, for the building. And it reminded us of the city um, with the views. And we thought, my god, why isn't anybody doing anything with this building? I mean, for 14 years, we've looked at it. There's so many architects and, and, and builders and realtors in the river towns. Why isn't anybody doing anything with this project? We, we couldn't understand it. Now I understand it. I, I don't, I'm getting to know about the codes and the waivers. Uh, I'm learning about that. But really, more this came out of a need. Yes, as, out, of, out of a personal need, because uh, my taxes are going to go up to $30,000. I have two children that are coming out of college, but I also have a child that's an eighth grader. And she wants to go to the Dobbs Ferry Schools High School next year, like her sisters did. And I can't afford the big house anymore. I can't afford the taxes and pay off my college loans. So this really came out, and a lot of my friends in the area, when, when their taxes go up to $30,000, they're going to be looking for housing too. So we said, okay, let's try to get this going because we'll have downsizers. Now, the people that were here at the last meeting, um, the young people that were here at the last meeting that were threatened, the one young, young lady that I personally know that was in tears, uh, some of them won't come back. We're not talking millennials, okay? I'm going to talk as a realtor now, and I'll go back to as a human being and a resident in a minute. But as a realtor, there is, there is, you know, um, we're talking about the young professionals. There was a jewelry designer. The other woman was a nurse. There was a finance guy. These are people in their 30s, mid to late 30s, that don't have any kids yet. Maybe they want to. They want to stay in the village. They are priced out of the city because I can tell you, all my clients in the city, because I work out of the city, at Douglas Settlement and also the River Towns, they are priced out because a two bedroom, two bath is $2 million. So if I can offer them at $650 a square foot or $700 a square foot, whatever we decide on, I can offer them this with a view. Some amenities, or no, now we, we don't have all the amenities that we started out with, and that's fine because we all want to keep it small. We all really love the village and we want to revitalize the downtown that I guess we're all in agreement with. But that's what we're targeting. The downsides of the people like me that want to stay in the village, that can't afford the big house, and the young professional. Those people were not staged or put here by any of these people. I, I, don't, I haven't talked to anybody about 
Whether or not you want to live there, that would be great. Um, but I understand that it would be a conflict of interest, but I want to live there. And that's where this came from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more uh, group one left? Any more group one? I think we've got everybody. Lee? Oh, one. 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 Lee's two. Two. Nancy's three. Three, four, Nancy. Okay. Test. Test one. Whew. Hearing a lot about this. Peter, who are you and where do you live? <laughs> I live in California. I've just flown in today. I'm Pete Baglier. I live on uh, Clinton Avenue. Been here for about 14 years. Grew up in Sleepy Hollow. Um, look, I'm a, uh, I'm a startup guy. I like new things. I like building. Can't stand still. Um, look, you look around the town. We need to prosper, we need to help. I help a lot of kids get jobs. I raise a lot of money for different events. And I think uh, as we move forward, there's a lot of people here that your kids want to get good jobs, they want to go to good schools, we want good people in town. And uh, I think we need to move on some good things. I think a lot of people see things as, as not changing. And uh, I think I've been here for about 14 years. I'm friends with a lot of people that are from here as well as that are uh, business people that do different things. I know most of the board. I think some of the board, actually I know most of the board, I don't know everybody else. I think if we're not creative and you raise uh, more jobs, more things, more creativity, uh, towns die. I think some businesses are doing well, but some businesses aren't doing well. Father, are you with me on this or what? Father Tip, what is, what's going on? Are you following us? What's going on? Come on, I listen to you at church. You gotta listen to me here. Let's just, let's, let's roll with that. All right, so uh, again, I'm Ford, and I think it's a great idea, and I want this town and to prosper and the people that are doing business here to make some money. Thank you. So, any other questions? Thanks, Peter. Hi, uh, Kevin Byrne. I live at 269 Broadway. I'm battling for youngest, I think, here. Yeah. This man. Hey, Kevin, speak into the mic a little bit. Hello? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, all right. Um, I'm here. Uh, I'm an engineer. I have site development background. Um, more so, not against things that should be done. But right now, it's more of a sequence of construction that's going on. We have three empty lots. There's rumors of integrity of the buildings. We have a 150, 160 year old aqueduct that runs through town, which some of these buildings are on. I'm not saying this one specifically, but looking at that, you're not gonna plop a building on top of a garage. You have to go down a foundation. What, what has been done to you know, signify that that's gonna be okay and done right? And that's really my only comment towards that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Constantine Stanley, good evening, Mayor and Board Members. The Hahn Memo of January 22nd, <clears throat> signed by Dwight Douglas, Village Consultant, reads as a persuasive commentary for the Board to vote for the waivers, whereas a consultant's report should contain advantages and disadvantages of a subject in order for a Board to draw from it. Granting extensive waivers will set a precedent. This is evidence in the, in the memo's language of, quote, the Board of Trustees has waived site plan review altogether for a number of projects and where there were no site planning issues, end quote. These waivers should never be granted as it ignores and reverses zoning that is intended to protect property, citizens, and the community. The memo continues that, that, that quote, a good number of this type of waiver has been issued over the past two to three years. Some include minor amendments to Rivertown Square and to Ashford, end quote. Since the memo 
notes the waivers are minor. They don't compare to the major ones sought for 75 Main. Given that River Towns is incomplete and 2 Ashford's construction is at a standstill, the effects are unknown. The memo notes that 66 was given a waiver for insufficient parking. This waiver is an example of a math formula that is written into the code for projects that lack required parking, called pileup, which is not arbitrary and is irrelevant to the type of waiver sought. Another waiver cited is 81 Main, which was to permit usage of part of the first floor of, for residential purposes. The minor waiver is not a the neighborhood. None of the examples in the memo are comparable to the 75 main waivers and must be stricken from the memo as valid examples. Instead, a memo would be best served by using the completed site of Chauncey Square that the Board of Trustees granted five waivers that have caused numerous adverse consequences, unsafe conditions for the community, and poor quality of life for its neighbors due to the waivers that were non-site compatible, such as permitting the development to be built on a 1.5 acre instead of the minimum five acres, along with the increased site coverage, setbacks of 20 feet instead of 100, increased height from three to four stories, two drive-ins that were not permitted in the more restrictive district. The project failed to meet the criteria that waivers could be issued that were better than the site-specific plan. The majority of people who have been to Chauncey have proven reasons that the project is adverse, and that includes the mayor who has publicly stated over, even prior to the River Town's construction, that he avoids Chauncey Square because of the traffic issues. The waivers issued were fundamentally flawed and is a valid example of the detriments that extensive waivers cause. The consultant fears that if the project goes to the ZBA, not only would they be confined to grant minimal variances pursuant to New York State's village Oh, the consultant claims they were, quote, not involving extensive time and an analysis conducted by the planning board and ARB, unquote. The, the same can be the, valid. Could you uh, wrap up here? Okay, like another 30 seconds? 30 seconds, yeah. The same can be said for the BOT who was not involved in that capacity, so they would not be any more qualified to issue a waiver just because they gave themselves the right. The ZBA, as well as the board, have access to all studies of all projects. And, and are similarly situated as the Board of Trustees to exercise that power, to, to examine the project de novo. The memo states, quote, that 24 feet height variance could not meet the minimal requirement, end quote. A variance is restricted because the standard of review requires the project demonstrate extenuating circumstances and is non-conforming. The project does not meet the standard of review for the height variance. The reality is that a variance request for two stories smaller taller that then the permitted height is no longer a variance but a complete circumvention of the code. Since this application has not proven its case for criteria needed for waivers, the request must be denied. Just because a project is larger than the code permits and is more Excuse profitable me. for the applicant doesn't mean it is better for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, if you have something you want to read and you can't get it in the three minutes, please, uh, we said this, well, make sure you submit it so that we get all that information and we will read everything. Nancy, is there another one over here left on this side? Just Nancy and Vicky and just Vicky? Okay. Wow, you're going to get Vicky and Nancy and one of them after the other. Right. Uh, Nancy Delmarico Bataglano, 81 Grandview. Uh, I wanted to echo what Steve Tilley said about having a pause, a little break in the action. Uh, I think. Another thing he said about kind of a homey housing that is similar to Hudson Terrace right across the way and all of the, all of the buildings on uh, north on Palisade Street. Um, that's one of my concerns. <clears throat> the other thing I'd like to say is it's been, studies have shown, and I wrote to you about this, studies have shown that a dollar of revenue costs a dollar fifty or a dollar twenty-five in expenditure for a village. We now have River Town Square, we have 68, 66, 68, we have a Terracone property, which is a number both my husband and myself don't know. 78. Um, 78, 78 Main. And this project, <clears throat> you know, the Rudy's property is sitting there, and we, who knows what's going to happen there. I mean, it really is time to take 
to assess where we're going as a village because I have lived through so many developments in my 61 years here that have worked. For instance, River, um, Walden Wood. What a wonderful little development that is. It was woods. It, it came, they, the developer worked with the topography and made a lovely, a lovely development. Then you have, uh, I was on the ARB for a while and I, I have a number of them in my head. I'm not going to go down to specifics, but there are others that did not work, <clears throat> you know, that have caused more traffic and more parking problems, which you just solved, did a lovely job solving the par parking on Palisade Street, and now this. You know, it's, it's just got to, you just have to stop and take assess what, where we're going as a village. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And the lovely Miss Vicki Jones. Vicki Jones, 55 Grandview Avenue, Dobbsbury, New York. I'd like to publicly thank my hero and champion, Donnie Vitagliano, for sticking up for my honor. I appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> what I'd like to say, first of all, is um, a lot of things have already been said, so I don't have to say it. And um, my heart goes out to this woman that that's her dream. Um, I'm on the train all the time. And I love it when I sit with new people moving to Dobbs Ferry that say, what a deal. I was paying $35,000 a year to educate a child. I don't care what taxes I'm paying in Dobbs Ferry. It's worth it. I can have two kids in school. End of story. Okay. <clears throat> but let's talk about this project now and um, what makes this project um, raise my attention. What raises my attention is I love this building. In fact, when they were building the monolith of the library, which is now small in comparison. Um, they had used the fact that they wanted to tie this building into the continuation of the program. I don't blame the developer for the way they design it. When you look at Dobbs Ferry, you see that Rivertown Square has the same elements. Our Walgreens has the same elements. The Berlin Wall or to um, Ashford Avenue has many of the same elements. It seems to be the way that our community is being defined. And I'm very happy for anything they can do, and I don't care how many units they stick inside Oceana. But the back part of that building is what I think is um, very upsetting to me, because it, it's right in the middle of a, an old neighborhood. Um, uh, many years ago, I actually thought I would like to sell my house and buy a house on Hudson Terrace until I realized they were all multifamily houses and I really didn't want to live in a multifamily house. But they don't look like multifamily houses. And neither does this, the house at the end of the block here, which is a condominium, which was rebuilt. And I, I was busy living a life. I didn't follow those things. And I said, that's, that's a big house. And then somebody said, it's a condominium. I said, oh. Well, that's pretty cool. It does. It fits in. It, it's part of the vision plan. It increased density. It looks like a house. And I said, that's cool. And the same thing happened on number one Main Street. Although I heard it was approved as three family and turned out to be four family. But hey, it stops Ferry. Those things happen. <laughs> but what I'd like to speak to the board tonight about is really the importance of maintaining that smaller building in the back. That building that they've built there now uh, it seems to me, I don't know what they're planning to do in the basement of the front park, but it seems like some of the parking could be in that park. Um, if this project would have been brought forward and absolutely had some of the elements of the house at the end of the street, I actually have some photos here that I sent to the board earlier, and I'll be happy to give you copies of. Um, and I sent you guys a note um, for the record saying that, you know, you guys have the power to maintain the character that illustrates who we are as a community. We can either be like Cape Cod, Cape May, Irvington, or become like Yonkers. And this is Yonkers. 
Um, from our village building code, it talks about these waivers that you, you guys have the right to offer to, to exercise tonight. But, uh, not tonight, but whenever you decide to do it. Um, but it says, you know, in, in the judgment of such waiver or modification, you guys have the right, you, the, 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 three tru the six trustees and the mayor have the right to make your own modifications on those waivers. And here's some of the things that I think you should discuss. The number of units that are being used in the last in that last area, I heard speak spoken earlier saying it was eight units in the back. Um, how many square feet are regulated in eight units? I mean, that seems to me like a pretty big substantial area. There's no right that gives this developer the right to build a swimming pool and a health club within its facilities. They're not doing it anymore? Okay, well that was part of what I had heard in seeing different the shell game of which project are we looking at this week. Um, and then, you know, I, I would really like you guys to consider telling the applicant, reduce the density. If they, if they, if they have a smaller building, it's going to cost them less money. The taxes will still be relevant. And, you know, maybe they live on the top floor of that building or they move into the penthouse of this building, the people that that's their dream. But when they have their dream, they're taking away the dreams and the lives of the people that live on Palisades, that that's their home. And I only hope if anybody would put something five floors next to my house, that this many people would come in protection of my property. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Um, okay, so we got, we got through group one. Thank you all very much for your comments. Now, uh, the next group we want to take is group... No, we got group one. Um, so group two will be anybody who uh, just we haven't heard from before. You may not have been at the last meeting, but we do want to hear from you. So, um, Doug? Start with you. Uh, how many do we have in this group? Group two, Jeff, Father Tim. Okay, great. Mark, Scott, three minutes. Good evening, Mayor. I have a lot to say, but first, I'd like to three thank minutes. I'd like to thank everybody for what they do on this board, the planning board, the architecture review board. I think it's a very responsible system we have. All the people that show up for these meetings, I think, is productive, but. I'd like to say we have a downtown that's in blight right now. And slowly but surely, because of the mayor's efforts and the rest of the board's efforts, it's starting to get a rejuvenation. I think this project is beautiful. I think they're doing a historical renovation on it, which people aren't considering, that adds an enormous cost to the construction aspect in it. I've owned more residential real estate than anybody in this room in this village. I've developed more residential real estate than anybody in this room in this village. And I'd just like to say that the process, although it's necessary, and to see like new people move to the community and then think they have a lock and a key of what people that own things are allowed to do, I would just like to say that you have the right to use a waiver. I think that the waiver does not set a precedent towards anything. I think that by you utilizing the waiver specifically for each project, project as it comes in front of you is responsible development. And I'd just like to say, I think it's a beautiful building. Any rendition of it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Father Tim? Good evening. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address you. Uh, my name is Father Timothy Scannell. I reside at 11 Bellwood Avenue, the pastor of Sacred Heart, a Lady of Pompeii Parish here in Dobbs Ferry. I've been a Rivertown's resident for over 40 years, between Irvington here and Dobbs Ferry, so I'm no newcomer to the area. My comments concern the impact that the proposed development of 75 Main Street will have on Our Lady of Pompeii Church and its worshipers. As you know from the extensive coverage in the enterprise last year, Our Lady of Pompeii, which was founded in 1922, was slated to be closed by the Archdiocese of New York as part of its master plan to close or merge parishes they felt were no longer viable or serving the needs of the community. The parishioners of Our Lady of Pompeii responded by showing that the parish was not only financially viable, but that it was serving a larger membership. From 2004 to 2016, the numbers of registered families increased from 140 to 250. 
In the end, the archdiocese, when forced by our parishioners to take note of the vibrancy and viability of Pompeii, reversed its stance and agreed to allow it to remain open. For quite some time, parking for church services and functions at Lady Pompeii has been a major problem. The church does not have a parking lot the parishioners can use when coming to church. They depend upon local street parking, which is at a premium on Sundays. The proposed development of 75 Main Street will exacerbate the issue of parking by having our parishioners, businesses, and additional residents competing for a shrinking number of parking spaces. Most of our worshipers, which include many seniors, drive to church. When they do find a parking space, usually at some distance, they often have to walk uphill to get to church. A few older parishioners have told me recently that when they fail to find a parking space anywhere close to the church, they returned home without attending Mass. Any indication that the number of Sunday worshipers is declining at Our Lady of Pompeii for whatever reason would be a major factor for the Archdiocese of New York to reconsider whether Pompeii should remain open. After our parishioners fought so hard this past year to keep Our Lady of Pompeii open, it would be tragic and I think shameful to see their efforts come to naught because we're insensitive to the religious and spiritual needs of many in our community. Since Masses are not offered on Sunday evenings in any of our neighboring towns, including North Yonkers, Hastings, Arsley, or Irvington, those who presently come to the 5 p.m. Mass at Lady of Pompeii have no alternative site to travel to if Pompeii closes and if they're not able to find parking spaces. At the present time, they vie for whatever parking is available. I understand that waivers that are granted for a proposed project are to be relatively minor and are to benefit the health, safety, and welfare of the community. But to be honest with you, I fail to see how this project serves the spiritual and religious well-being of our community. And I hope that is included in that term, welfare of the community. I hope I fail to see how that would be furthered if it jeopardizes the continuing existence of a church that served the people of this village for the past 94 years. We want to be around to celebrate our 100th anniversary six years from now. And furthermore, variances to height requirements, or variances, whatever you want to call it, shouldn't result in a structure that looms over its neighbors. This proposed development unquestionably will loom or tower over a Lady of Pompeii church. In most of the civilized world, the structures that rise majestically over other buildings in a city or town are houses of worship. They serve to lift up the spirits of the residents and they remind them of what is the soul of their community. What I'd like to ask you to consider tonight is what will lift up our spirits and what's going to define the soul of this village. Thank you very much. Thank you, Okay, we have a few over here. Jeff? Uh, Jeff Young, Palisade Avenue, and now the wonderful opportunity to follow a man of worship in a pulpit. Um, I wanted to uh, extend my thanks to the, uh, the Board of Trustees and also special thanks to Jennifer Dorman who helped provide me the guidance to getting me through all the different uh, documents that I was able to review as well as the Dobbs Ferry TV. And I, I don't, I'm really not here to propose any solutions, but I, I think that in the grand scheme of things, from what I've seen in the time that I've lived in Dobbs Ferry and in the river towns, that being sensitive to one another's needs ends up getting us very far in the process. And while we have to listen about a nurse who would like to be able to live in the community, about people who want to downsize, about people who'd like to be able to have a buying opportunity. The truth of the matter is, is that we have to figure out some way of moving forward because there's an irrefutable need to improve our tax base here. And at the same time, we do not want to do things that infringe upon the reasons why we all moved or have grown up in, in Dobbs Ferry. So the question is, in my mind, when we're looking at this project or any other project, is there a better way to do it? Is there a way for improvement? And should we be asking for more than what we're asking, what we're seeing here simply because 
we're caught up in things that, for instance, I don't understand, the waivers, the engineering, the codes, these are above my pay grade. So to me, what makes the community better when you were involved in a project like this? Well, my first question is one that I don't know if anybody's discussed yet, but is $240,000 or $250,000 going to a segregated recreation fund actually enough? Is this something that if we dedicate all that money to, we can actually improve that pocket of Memorial Park? Can we have bathrooms there that are compliant with American Disabilities Act? Can we improve the swimming pool? Can we improve the children's playground? Because if we're trying to attract people to come in who will have children or who want to go to a park, well, we might as well make it so they can actually enjoy it. Um, do we have the ability to alleviate the parking and environmental impact by asking developers to provide money or funding towards zero emission vehicles so that parking is not as much of an issue but that seniors or other people who we don't want to be driving have zero emission access to the stores, to the train station, so we're not competing with even more people to be getting parking spots. Are these things that we can, as a village, ask people to offer us so that we can enjoy our village more without putting more burden on the things that we already know are stretched? And then um, lastly, which is a, a key issue because we keep on talking about it, is putting X number of families in a residential area enough to truly alleviate the issues we have with developing retail in the downtown area. So thank you very much for your time and I thank everybody for hanging in there with me and for Father Tim for me having to follow you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Tracy Frisch. I live at 18 Hilldale Road in Dobbs Ferry. I've been a resident of Dobbs Ferry for six years. My husband and I have two small children that we plan on raising here and putting through the Dobbs Ferry public school system. So that's why I've made it a point this evening to attend this meeting. I thank you for the opportunity to speak and I thank you for the thankless work that you put in on behalf of the village and its residents. I make this statement not only about 75 Maine, but about the variance approval process in general. I think everyone in this room can agree that we all want what we feel is best for Dobbs Ferry. It's how we define what is best for our village that's different. While I understand you may have the best intentions, I hope you can see that in this case, actions really do speak louder than words. And I believe that by shutting out the zoning board, from ruling on the substantial variances being requested here in connection with 75 Main, you'd be giving off the appearance that you're more aligned with the developer's interests than with the majority of Dobbs Ferry residents. And let me be clear, I don't think the two are necessarily mutually exclusive. I wholeheartedly support responsible development in Dobbs Ferry and historic preservation. But those aren't the issues here. The issues as I see it are overcrowding our public schools, exacerbating the parking problem downtown, and setting a precedent whereby the Board of Trustees allows substantial waivers in favor of oversized development in our village. The Village Code has set up a fair process by which anyone looking to build in Dobbs Ferry and seeking variances from the Village Code, residents and developers alike, must go through the Zoning Board. But if the majority of the Board of Trustees and the Mayor allow developers to circumvent the Zoning Board step in this process, it raises the appearance that the majority of this Board is aligned with the developer's best interests. And while you personally may not agree that 75 Main rises to the level of an oversized development, regardless of the changes that are being proposed tonight, respectfully, that's for the Zoning Board and not your decision to make. So I strongly urge that this board vote against granting the requested waivers and let the proper process take place that was established to protect against oversized development in our small village. Perhaps even more importantly, give the residents of Dobbs Ferry faith that our trustees are here to serve us and preserve the character of our village. And I'm struck by two things I haven't heard tonight, and excuse me because this is my first time attending one of these meetings, but one is the affordability of the units. The only thing we've heard is from the realtor who said these might be 650 a square foot. 
let's say they're 2,000 square feet, that's $1.3 million a unit. It doesn't sound very affordable to me. I also haven't heard from the supporters arguments speaking in support of the waiver power here, specific arguments as to what's in the code. I just haven't heard that tonight. I'm a little bit surprised by that. Anyway, I thank you for your time and for considering my position. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Anybody else over here at all? And over here? So you, one, John. Is okay? Great. Yes, go. Sorry. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, my name is Ed Hardesty. I uh, live on Palisade Avenue. Um, it's hard. There's so many things you want to respond to. Uh, I've lived in Dobbs Ferry since 2002. Uh, my wife and I have worked on the Dobbs Ferry School Foundation, helped raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for the school. I ran the auctions with the late Judy Blackwell um, Conowich uh, for many, many years. We really care about what goes on here. and. You know, we, we have always looked at this building and thought it could be so great because that whole area of town is so kind of sad and run down, needs help. And I don't know about zoning or any of that stuff, I, I, waivers and this. You've got experts for that. They've looked at it. They've ruled on it. Uh, that's not what I do. But what I do do is real estate. And for 22 years, I've done nothing day in and day out but sell real estate to people both here and in New York City. So I actually do know quite a bit about that. And, you know, I've been working on this building for 10 years. It's been basically vacant and rotting since before we got here, the whole time we've lived here. And, you know, Mr. Tilly made the comment, time for a pause, and I heard it echoed. I would say that this building's been in a long pause, like so much so that it's falling down. And, and there's a reason for that. And, you know, I hear over and over that, that that lower back half needs to be smaller and it needs to be this and it needs to be that and responsible development. But I don't know if the people that are saying that actually understand development and what's involved in that. And I, I don't think you do or you probably wouldn't say it. And if you, I'm, I'm going to offer this up. I, I would be happy to sit down with anyone because there's a lot of hostility and animosity out here. And, and I get it, we all have different opinions, but this is one thing I, I can talk about. So if you want to understand what actually goes into restoring a building like that to historic preservation standards, incredibly expensive and difficult. You know, if you talk about LEED certification, very expensive. It's not like you just go and do it, sorry. It's a lot of work and a lot of money. You're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, there is a point, why is that building, and I don't hear this question ever asked or answered, why do you think that building's been sitting there for so long? Because no one can do it. Because it's not economically viable. You know, the picture Mr. Tilly painted, and I have respect for him, of that, you know, beautiful landscape thing and going on. You know, if you get the seller to drop two and a half million dollars off his price, and, you know, we can rethink all this, okay, but that's not reality. So given where we are with the economics of real estate and stuff like that, and the cost of doing all this other work, nobody comes in here, and that's why I sat there, because nobody, and I've brought at least six developers of my own here, and I know of others that other architects and things and builders in the town have looked at this building, it makes no sense to do it any other way. So I don't think there is somebody that's just lining up to come do it. I really don't. I know I'm out of time. But I do want to do one thing. I do really care about this town and what goes on here. And to Father Tim, we've never met. But I, should the board see fit to approve this, I get that the construction's a headache. I get that there are problems. I get their concerns about stuff. I would be willing to volunteer my time as a representative of the d development team to work with the church, to work with whomever had concerns, to try to go through that process and alleviate and address them as we go on to whatever extent that would help. Because I really do care, and, and I hope we can all find a way to make this work. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Ed. Mark? Thank you, Mayor. Mark Legiro. Livingston Manor, life, lifelong resident, Dobbs Ferry. 
I too wish I could have seen something that looks like Hudson Terrace going up in that space there. But my concerns are also for the church, and uh, Father Tim nailed it. You know, I can't add much to it, but I will take you back to 1923 when my great grandfather and a lot of other ancestors, families that are in this room now, wanted to build the church. They had to put up their hard earned money to do it. All right, and the results sit up at the top of the hill. From down this end to the other end of Cedar Street, you look up, you see Pompeii Church. It's supposed to be that way. The church is the star of the neighborhood. All right? We got this coming down the street now. It's going to choke us. All right? We know. Cars, they reproduce like rabbits. I don't think you, you could predict how many cars you're going to be able to put away. All right? I know it's 2016, but the ghosts of 1923 also have a say in this. Thank you. Thank you. Broccoli, Marshamble Avenue, Dobbs Ferry. Um, I look around the room and I see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of unfamiliar faces. But the one thing that I hear, the people that are for this project are all attacking the people that, I guess, aren't, or not, aren't for 100% of this project. No one has come up here yet and said, we are 100% against this project. I don't think anybody doesn't want to see anything there. That's not the point. That's not why we're here. We're not an angry mob. There's, there's no yelling and screaming up here. We're up here voicing our opinions and our concerns. I have um, several concerns about this project. First of all, Mr. Mayor, I believe it was, uh, I watched it on TV, I think it was last week, or one of the meetings, you said that the school board was okay with this project, or I didn't have a concern about this project. Is that true? No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. It was so one of the projects that you spoke to. We would actually discuss with them and reach out to them to get their input. So right, and they were, and they were, there was, you, still, you said there was no, I thought there was no concern, no. No, I didn't okay, say I'm that. sorry for that. But there, since that conversation, they are now doing an independent study. Is that correct? You know anything about that? I don't know. All right, well, I spoke to Mrs. Brady, and there is going to be an independent study done by the school board to see if something like this project and other projects in the community will affect the, out, affect the school, um, school board and the taxes. So that is something that is in the works by the school board. I think it's something that should be addressed and at least wait and see what they have to say before we start adding all these. Um, we have met with, with Lisa and, uh, and some members of the Board of Education to give them all the information that we have on this to share everything with them. And we have very good lines of communication open, so we'll definitely be having, you know, taking that input from the school board for sure. Okay, but like I said, they do, they do have an independent study that they're paying for. That, I mean, it's something that we should really, I think, should wait for and see what they have to say. That's real important. I mean, a lot of people have kids here and they want to see, you know, our kids get the best, obviously. That's why we're all here. Um, my second issue is with the um, the issue is how that the police department issue. Is, has anyone spoke to about all? You know, I'm sure you have, but is there going to be an issue with all the people that are coming into the village with that and the new people? The you know, police department, the fire department is very taxed as it is. I know, and it's very short. We always work with numbers is to make sure we have enough for that. Um, Another, another thing is a lot of people are asking like $240,000, like Jeff said, for the uh, recreation department. I, that's not nearly enough money. I'm sure these developers aren't here because they're not making money. I'm sure they're here making a lot of money. I feel that some of that money should come back to the village and our kids. I mean, I think that's something that we really need to address. I mean, I, um, I believe the village of Tarrytown... Sorry. Um, is that me? <laughs> sorry. I believe it was the village of Tarrytown... Um, about three or four years ago, had a big, a much bigger project down the riverfront, but they were able to get a, um, a community center for the um, senior citizens. They were able to have their, um, their DPW rebuilt, and I believe they're even in the process of getting a swimming pool for, from the developers, I mean, because the developers are making enough money where they were allowed to do this. I know this is not on the same scale, obviously, but th there could be probably a little bit more than $240,000 that could be, be uh, given to the village. I mean, we are making a ton of, you know, waivers for them. I mean, 
And what is the village getting out of it except for more residents and making them more money? As far as the retail space goes, I mean, we have empty retail space all up and down the village as it is, so needing more retail spaces. And, and I listen, I, I believe we need change. It, it's, it's definite. But how about maybe even like, even if it's not for just the recreation department, throw money into revitalizing maybe four or five different storefronts or, or something like that. And I'm sure they have the ability, since they are a developer, that it'd be a lot cheaper for them to come in and, you know, redo some faces of these, some of these buildings than, than we do, you know. And just a thought. Um, I'm sure my time is all almost up, but... All right, that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much for coming. Any other residents that haven't spoken before but wish to? Yes, ma'am. Thank you to the board. My name is Jessica Malbert. I live at 26 Bradley Street. I have a six-year-old daughter. We rented here for two years before she was born and lived here ever since and want to continue living here. And I have to say, I hate seeing the empty storefronts on Main Street, but I'm not sure a um, building the size and scope is going to address that. What I can personally speak to, one of the reasons I'm speaking, for the last eight months, I've driven around almost 75 Main near Dobbs Ferry Karate. There is no parking from five to seven on Friday nights, it is very, very difficult. And it's hard to see why this won't cut into this issue. And we like to go out for dinner. We don't want to have to go to Ridge Hill. We don't want to have to go somewhere like Rivertown Square. We want to stay in Dobbs Ferry. And my main concern is something like this really affects the ability of the residents to get downtown. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think one of the, in the glasses, if I can, sir. Mark, you, oh, you're in the next group. My name is Conrad Balke. I live at uh, Lucky 13 Landing Drive, 13 <laughs> Landing. <clears throat> I had not intended to uh, talk tonight, but listening, uh, I want to say, first of all, I'm a relatively new resident of Dobbs Ferry. My family and I moved here just a year ago. Uh, we moved here from years of residence in two communities that were notorious for their lack of process, discussion, transparency, and I'm really thrilled that tonight people are saying, look, we're not an angry mob. We're talking about this in a rational way. Wow, what a breath of fresh air. What a... Uh, breath of openness. But I'm, you know, I'm young, I'm innocent, we've only been here a year, and I wanted to just, even though I'm a lawyer, give a non-legal gut reaction to something I'm hearing, which is that if I hear about a possible waiver process that's based, and as a lawyer I believe words are important, on a waiver being granted in situations involving health or safety, or well-being, to me that has connotations of preventing something that would otherwise be deleterious to the community. And also when I've seen waivers like this before, a sense of urgency. We've got to do this, we've got to grant a waiver because otherwise health is jeopardized, safety is jeopardized, well-being is jeopardized. This to me looks like a different animal and I honestly don't have my mind made up about it, but I believe in process, I believe in transparency. It sounds to me like the best thing to do would be let's not do what waivers sometimes have the connotation of in these circumstances, the connotations, the sound of rushing something through, railroading through. People have talked a lot about wanting a pause here, figuring out who we want to be. I should say you, because I've only been here a year, who you want to be. Um, but I've heard a number of people here say, I have real concerns about this project. I understand that you can grant a waiver. I don't concede that. This waiver reads to me like it was put in place for a different purpose. And I will be very interested to see what comes out of a full, complete discussion and process. Thank you. Thank you, John.
Hi, my name is Matthew Cachota. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Zarin and Steinmetz. Um, we've been retained to represent Our Lady of Pompeii Church with regard to this matter. Now, for, I want to come in saying this, that we were just retained yesterday, so I'm just getting my hands around something that you all have been living for quite some time, obviously. So uh, if I misstate something, I'd ask for the board's latitude. We understand that the board and the plan that this board and the planning board have been working with the applicant on this project for several months, and I want to commend this board and the planning board. It seems that you've gone very in depth on several issues here, and I commend you for that. We're not coming in here at the last minute questioning how you did your jobs. We understand the rule of reason, the secret process, but respectfully, the church feels that there's a couple of issues that the board hasn't has failed to take a sufficiently hard look at. As a result, there's significant impacts that still exist. And in this situation, an environmental impact statement should be mandated from the applicant. Respectfully, that's not a high threshold. As I'm sure your council, your council has told you, if a project may have a significant impact, that's enough to mandate that an EIS be done. We would welcome the opportunity to work with your consultants, as well as the applicant's attorney and consultants, as part of the EIS process, to look at alternatives and to come to a consensus on a project that works for everyone. Now, the, church has a few concerns. The first is the visual impacts of this potential new development on the church. We understand the village was concerned with this as well, which is why uh, the village's engineer required a visual, a visual impact study to be done. The study found the mass of the new building with the existing building is much larger than the, building, the rest of the buildings on Palisade Street. I appreciate that attempts have been made to attempt to step back the mass of that building. But respectfully, I haven't heard any discussion of alternatives involving significantly smaller development, and that's something that I've heard echoed from several residents tonight. The village's engineer also noted that the existing building already poses a significant visual impact on the Palisade Street properties. This is in your record. Well, the building that's being built there would only be getting larger, so instead of this impact being mitigated, it's actually being exacerbated. Again, we'd welcome the opportunity to work with the applicant and the village during the EIS process to find a way to reduce the mass of this project so that it doesn't loom over the church and the other properties on Palisade Street. Next, the church is concerned the board hasn't, take, hasn't taken the requisite hard look at parking, which again is something that I've heard from several residents tonight, and specifically on street parking. The project includes 28 spaces. From what I saw on the record, part of it, uh, there's a study from Mazer Consultant finding that the development is actually gonna require 31 spaces no spaces have been set aside for the retail component of the project or for visitors. So there's empirical data in the record demonstrating that a minimum of 15 spaces would be removed from the existing on-street parking pool. Please understand that on-street parking is the lifeblood of churches such as Our Lady of Pompeii. It doesn't have a parking lot. During five o'clock mass on Sundays, attendance reaches almost 150 people. That means potentially 50 to 60 cars that are being parked. Every space taken away takes away from people's ability to worship. Fewer cars means less, means less attendance. And as you heard from Father Tim, there's very serious concerns that that could lead to the archdiocese shutting down what's been an institution in Dobbs Ferry for nearly 94 years. We understand the board and the planning board has done a lot of work here. We're not trying to come in in the 11th hour and step on people's toes. But we do feel that several potentially significant impacts have been overlooked. This, is, this may ultimately necessitate an EIS. There's no reason to rush this. At a minimum and respectfully, the board should adjourn this public hearing and allow for additional comment. We'd, we'd like to delve deeper into the record and we could potentially solve these concerns without having to go any further. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you know the process and you can correct any uh, issues that you have to the village attorney. So you're, you're well aware of the process. I would like to drop Thank off you. the submission letter for my firm. Okay, any other residents that we have not heard from before? Johnny, we haven't heard from you. Yeah, you, John, you want to, you want to? Bring the mic back to you, John. Here. Huh? Yeah, here, go back. He's a warrior. Uh, <laughs> I don't like to fight for it here, but there's too many people in Dobbs Ferry. I don't know why I want to build and build and build. Into the mic. 
It's too crowded. You have too many people. Because he's stuck. It's like Manhattan. That's Manhattan. That's not Doxbury. Joe, I don't know what to say. I I couldn't wait to get back here. When I moved out for 10 years old, I got married. My parents died and moved back. I hate it now. You know, I'm sorry to say, folks, but this is not the old Lobster Ferry that it was. Bring back the old neighborhoods. <coughs> Thanks, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I think we uh, heard from everybody that we hadn't heard from yet. So it's 9.30, uh, we keep going. And uh, so now I guess we'll take people that we have heard from before and go around and... Mario, you want to start? Good evening, Maura Tarasi, 138 Palisade Street. Um, I really would like to thank the board for the attention that they have put into this project. and. I really, on a very honest way, I want to thank the developer for all of your efforts, doing and redoing and trying to work with everybody's comments, everybody's concerns. So I, I really told you from the very beginning that I think that your building is, is a pretty building. It might not be what we want in that corner, but at the end of the day, it is a beautiful development. Um, I was wondering for a very long time why we were getting so many feedbacks from our wonderful neighbors at one uh, at Palisade Avenue, and now I realize that the developers that they are actually involved in this project live there, and that's why we have received such a massive, um, I guess, support from that area. And I'm, I'm glad that I was able to discover that tonight, as I've been wondering why are there are so many of them. Um, tonight we are preparing for our little um, uh, holiday event tomorrow for Valentine's Day with, uh, with the children. And before this meeting, I prepared 24 gift bags um, mm -hmm. for my first grader. I was shocked. I honestly, I was shocked that there were 24 names on her class. And my only concern, the reason why I'm standing here is that we continue to be concerned about the developers um, that they are coming into the village because it seems that every single developer um, wants to build multi-family homes. And with multi-family homes, of course, as we heard from many other people, comes families. And that is the only concern that I really have tonight, in addition to um, the concerns that uh, the church has with Pompeii. I parked this morning in front of uh, my apartment building, and I just looked down and I visioned the building there, and I wonder how would it look. I, at this point, I am not against it, and I'm not, I'm not in favor either. I just really would like for the village codes to be followed so that everyone can just, you know, be happy and just continue to live in a beautiful community as it is Dubs Ferry. And I really hate to see the division that we have going on right now and how people come up here and one throw at the other one. And it really, really disturbs me. So I just hope that we can come up to a resolution where everybody's happy and that we can please follow the village code just to maintain the integrity of the village. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Please. Uh, Bruce Richards, 153 Main. Uh, first, I'd just like to say, as the owner of an old building, you buy it, you fix it. It's not an option to say, well, I don't like this or I don't like that. Once you love it, you're into it. Now, on to what I could say. I know this is an architectural review board uh, situation I'm addressing, but many of these people in the room have not been going to those meetings, so I'd like to just read this two-minute thing and, and be done with it. Last week's article in the Enterprise was a good recap of 75 Maine. It confirms my fear given the article statements. I quote, the Board of Trustees, the developer must restore the historic facade. The word preserve is, and not restore should be used in any agreement made with the developer or the architect. The article goes on and Patty Stein Schneider states, there will be no change to the footprint, but there will be a historic restoration of the facade. I believe he refers to the restoring the facade to the 1895 Lawrence Building, shown in the most recent proposals tonight, not the Oceana facade that is present currently. In all meetings, Patty Steinschneider and the developers have cited the want to restore the facade to what it was prior to 1920. 
No drawings that we've been shown have reinstated the current facade. They have all been shown removed for larger storefront windows. This, uh, removing the neoclassical, the word preservation has never been used. I hope this is a clarification of this wording by the developer can be done. The Oceana building was the first structure in Dobbs to alter what was the Lawrence Feed building into the neoclassical structure that began the necklace of buildings northward on Main Street built between 1926 and 1928. These include the Village Hall and Fire Station, the Post Office, and the Greenberg Bank of 1927, which preferred the style in marble over brick to produce its neoclassical facade. These fit the revolutionary era of the village theme now present. The current proposal by the owner and developer of 75 Main has favored removing this historical neoclassical facade, which is the Keystone Main Street building, in favor of returning it to the feed store facade of 1895 with open frontal bays for the loading of hay into wagons to become large commercial windows. The removal of the neoclassical into a generic open facade allows the architect's addition of his palisade design of the building to be more industrial structure. By removing the Oceana neoclassical facade, historical preservation is not served. It is important to think of the whole cloth of Main Street when considering this proposal. The removal of the Oceana facade destroys the character echoed in the heart of the village and should not be removed in favor of the new addition's proposed generic design. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that it? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the board. I'm here tonight to um, submit a petition. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm here tonight to. Your name's Sandra. Oh, sorry. Sandra, Sandra Merrill, 32 Walnut Street. I'm here tonight to respectfully submit a petition. Um, it's signed by many concerned citizens, most of them Dobbsbury residents. Um, as of uh, 6 o'clock tonight, it contains 343 signatures. Uh, if you allow me to read it, it's very brief, and then I will uh, formally submit it to you. We are submitting this petition with res to respectfully request that you vote no to granting the substantial waivers requested in the proposed application for development at 75 Main Street. This application does not comply with the Dobbs Ferry Vision Plan or its downtown design guidelines, which were put in place to direct the decision-making process of the mayor and the board of trustees. We are for responsible and sustainable development and growth of the village. We are open and to and encourage all people from throughout New York City, Brooklyn, neighboring villages, and other parts of the country to join our community. In fact, many of us signing this petition were not born and raised here but moved from those very places. We, the residents, love Dobbs Ferry and have chosen to live here for its community, its family values, its history, and its cultural aspects. We believe that appropriate development of 75 Main Street is important and necessary to the village. However, we believe the revitalization and sustainability of 75 Main should include the following. One, preserve the original building's integrity, including its historical and architectural value as it relates to the rest of the buildings on Main Street. Two, provide additional affordable housing. Three, have lower heights and density fronting Chestnut and Palisade Street. Provide less mass and bulk while reflecting the character of that residential neighborhood. Four, present a much more benign face to Our Lady of Pompey, Pompey Church, which we've heard so eloquently about tonight. Five, offer a serious preservation approach, partially financed and controlled by tax credits. Six, provide more on-site parking without a decrease in existing on-street parking, and be consistent with our parking code. 
Seven, create an increased tax base for the village while sustaining the village's long-term expenditures. We believe that adherence to the code, the LWRP, and our vision plan protects the best interests of the, all the residents and allows for checks and balances in the process of approving projects and developments in the village. Otherwise, what is the point of any of these codes and regulations? Strict adherence to the procedures of the village code for each and every project, whether residential, commercial, or both, and whether presented by a developer or an individual, protects the integrity of the process and instills confidence in our elected officials. For all of these reasons, we strongly urge you, Mr. Mayor, and our Board of Trustees to vote no to granting these extensive waivers requested for the proposed development at 75 Main Street. Thank you for that. You, I, I will um, officially... Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we'll, uh, make sure we get that. Thank you very much. Okay, one more here up front, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Tag teaming again. Suzanne Sanzo, Palisade Street for 40 years, Dobbs Ferry for 62, and Brooklyn before that. I just mentioned Brooklyn because there's a competing petition with hers, which I signed online, that puts out as a point of uh, why people don't want this project is that there are some people that don't want people from Brooklyn. Now, I don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, just, I, my father was born in Brooklyn, and he was a, a Wall Street lawyer from Cornell, and uh, I'm all for Brooklyn. <laughs> so there are a few, uh, some of these things I've got from online, and if any of them are in error, I haven't had a chance to try to validate them. But with regard to the school tax, the school tax that would be derived from this project is uh, enough to pay for five and a half new kids in the school. However, I live a slight distance up the street from the project, and my building, the building on the right and on the left and across the street, all together have currently 15 occupied rental units. That's 15 dwelling units. And this other proposed building has 22 to 24, and they can, only can pay for five and a half school kids. Well. These 15 units in and around my building have 11 kids already. I don't think this uh, co computation of how many kids are going to be added is accurate because I've lived there for 40 years and it's never been like that there. So then there's another thing. Dobbs Ferry Code, uh, supposed, I believe, says that in conflicts between code provisions and uh, other ordinances and regulations, <coughs> the most stringent controls on development should apply. So when you have anything that is in conflict, this building to me is not the most stringent. The, a beautiful development there would be to have something that complies with the code. And, and most of the buildings on the street, while not totally in compliance with the code, are pretty well in compliance with the code. And we're doing fine. We're paying the taxes, and we're supporting the village and the, and the school, but we're going to have to pay more taxes if this new building only pays enough for five and a half kids, and it's going to, I suspect, have a multiple of that number of kids. Somebody's going to have to pay for those kids, and it's, it's going to go on to the taxes, so I don't think it's so lucrative for the village. And the other thing is, I was very happy to hear that the church has a lawyer hired, and because I believe that it would be very pleasing to me to see litigation if these waiver process is approved. I think this waiver deal is, as people have said repeatedly tonight, for much less imposing changes than are proposed here. And a waiver, wa the two requirements of waivers, for example, before you can have a waiver power, you're supposed to have a project, a plan that's better than others that are in compliance with the code. And this is way beyond any of the code. And then that's a prerequisite. And if you achieve that, you're supposed to have a, one, a plan that promotes the health and safety and general welfare. I don't see that this big high building does anything to promote health and safety in any way. 
and also that uh, the current condition, which is vacant and in, in a little bit of disrepair maybe, doesn't do anything to threaten the health and safety of the area. And the general welfare, if we put too many kids in the school, it's going to be less attractive for the welfare of the entire village. Property values will go down because the quality of education will go down. And I don't think that that's a very favorable deal. May, am, I, I ask, am I out of time? Could you wrap it up? Yeah, I'll let you go over actually by, by a bit here. So. Okay. There's no evidence that a code conforming plan would not be economically feasible. Sorry to take so long. Thank no, no, that's you. fine. Okay. You presented well. Thank you very much. Good job. Okay, Mike, you want to go? Okay. Anybody else? Mike Marrow, 32 Walnut Street. It was nice of everybody to save me 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, thank you guys for actually um, taking the time to pay attention to all of this stuff and acknowledging the letter that was sent to you directly. Um, it's also on file already in the with the village, so I won't rehash that. But I do have some different comments from some of the things that were brought up. Um, one, of the, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned with the redevelopment of downtown is, um, you know, specifically here, the displacement of the commercial professional space in downtown with increased residential density. Um, I'm concerned that there's disincentives for anybody to maintain their own properties. I don't know why. Uh, there also doesn't seem to be an, any incentive for people to move in um, substantial businesses to develop, um, you know, employment opportunities during the during the day that would attract real money for the rest of the day, not just when people come home from the city at night. Um, so that's one of the problems that I perceive that isn't actually um, solved with this. Um, this proposal. Um, another thing was uh, talking numbers. Uh, you know, with the massing here, the site plan lays out what the what the floor sizes are. Uh, the Oceana building itself has four floors, nineteen thousand four hundred square feet. Uh, the proposal in the back, because it's a double lot. Um, has about 18,000 square feet proposed for the two garage levels and 20,000 square feet in last week's drawings for the, for the residential levels, which makes it about twice the size of the Oceana building. So if, if there's a question of um, massing, I think that makes it pretty simple. Uh, the other thing is with the budgeting, We've heard 650 a square foot. If you're selling the units for a million, million and a half, obviously the tax impact there is that there's going to be a bigger tax base is the expectation, and that it's going to support the services by having really high taxes on, on these units. But that's not the same thing as, as arguing that this is an affordable housing project for um, you know, lower income people trying to move into, into downtown. Um, it would just be nice to see a consistent presentation and have that information um, compiled if that's whatever the argument happens to be from the board that we're saying, look, this is, this is what we're intending to take in and why and what it is we're selling and what we're getting back. Uh, you know, to the point of the, the recreation fees, uh, depending on the balance of the the tax receipts, especially to the school district, it's not as big an impact to the village, but the school district makes a big difference to all of our taxes. So if we have too high of a burden from all of the all of the residential units that are being poured into Main Street, um, you know that that you know if it was a three hundred dollar check that came back, it would take me a hundred years to recoup a five percent loss in my property value. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay, uh, I want to thank everybody for your comments. I thought this went really well tonight. Um, 
a good cross section and uh, really, really helpful. I want to thank everybody. No trustee has to answer that question that was presented earlier by that resident about interest in the building or relationship with the owners if they don't want to, but I will. I don't know the owner. Um, I just moved to the landing with my wife and we're real happy there. <laughs> so uh, I don't have, you know, I just don't have any uh, interest uh, in that building. I haven't had any discussions. I don't even have a relationship and I don't even know the owner other than having met him like all of you have met. Uh, and I don't know which owner he's talking about, the one who's maybe coming in or the one who's there right now. The one that's there right now, I met once in my life six and a half years ago. Never seen him since. Never, never, never knew the guy. So, I also do not know the owner. Uh, and the reality is that uh, in or around May 1st, my house is going on the market and uh, we are heading to Kendall One Hudson and Sleepy Hollow. So I have absolutely no part in this at all. I do not know the owner. I, uh, I own an income producing property that I live in, uh, so I have absolutely no intention of moving downtown in the foreseeable future. The general rule um, where I work is we don't comment on rumors, but this rumor I'll comment on. Like most of the people in the room from living here, I know who the owner is. Am I moving to the building now? But uh, I, honestly, I was a little surprised somebody would even ask that question. On a side note, I want to thank everybody who came out and expressed how they feel towards this building. Right, I think, Mara, you hit it right. You know, it's a shame that it is causing a divide amongst each other. Um, I think at the end, we all have to figure out a way to work together. Um, I think we all want something to go there. We all want what's best for the village. It's not us versus you. It's not you versus us. We all got to get through this together. So uh, thank you, everybody, for your coming out tonight and for your comments. And this is what makes us a part of the community by having communication like this. So thank you. I have never met the owner. I don't know the owner's name. Um, and I am pretty set where I live on Livingston Ave, for those of you who know me. Um, and from what I gather of the size of these units and um, the price per square foot we heard about, I'm pretty sure I can't afford to live there either. Um, but I do want to say, I actually didn't find to, tonight to be divisive at all. I was very impressed with how respectful and civil everyone was. And I think that's a testament to how great this community is. And that's why I love Dobbs Ferry. I, I also don't know the owner. Uh, I have no intention of moving there. Even though I live across the street from the construction of Rivertown Square, I'm <laughs> staying there on Ogden Avenue. So uh, I, I have no interest in that spot living there. Um, I also want to congratulate everyone as I've sat out there during the Rivertown Square whole thing and I just want to congratulate everyone on their uh, um, demeanor today and I think it went very well. So thank, thanks again. I also do not know the owner and uh, just recently bought a home in Dobbs Ferry, although I've been a lifelong resident um, and don't plan on moving anywhere. Um, so pretty happy where I live. Thank you. And uh, once again, just to reiterate, I think some of the uh, sentiment up here, you know, any development that comes before us, we have to analyze on behalf of the whole village. You know, we have to listen to everybody, which is what our duty is, and we are listening. We are, and we have extended the public hearings because this is an important decision, I think, for everybody up here and for every resident out there. It, it's a change to a neighborhood, and we don't take that lightly. So, you know, I know there's a lot of rumors out there, and I. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, I can assure you, at least from where I sit, that you know we're taking this very seriously and we'll continue to analyze this before we make any decision. And uh, thank you everybody for your input and the way everybody's projected themselves. I just, uh, for those of you who know me, I spent 13 years on the school board and listening to what people have said in terms of the cost of students the cost to students are basically derived by taking the total budget and dividing by the number of students in the schools. That's what gives you that $24,000 figure. It is not a figure of it costs exactly this. If you add one more student, it'll go from 
whatever it is, $40 million divided by 1,500 to $40 million divided by 1,501. So, you know, be, be careful with that. The issues come when you deal with class size and when you have anomalies. So that's the worry, but until we get to that point, uh, we will absolutely take that into consideration when we're looking at this project, or at least I will. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, just based on the comments that we heard tonight, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more still to, to think about with this project and discuss. And uh, my sense is that we should uh, not close the public hearing, but adjourn it. And uh, we'll continue to discuss. And uh, well, that's what we'll do as a community. So let's do that. Um, Darius, any advice or guidance you want to offer on the I know that some people that aren't here on uh, the 26th, I think it is, or 23rd? 23rd. I think our next meeting is the 23rd. Just uh, keep in mind, if you want to adjourn it to then, I think a few people are going to be out on the board that day. Um, do we want to have another special meeting? You want to leave it open and we can notify the public through your um, uh, uh, newsletter and through the internet. It's up to you. Adjourn until the 23rd. We won't be able to make a decision either. Yeah, we'll adjourn until the 23rd. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I'll let the developers represent us anything. But I think our inclination is to uh, adjourn the public hearing until the 23rd. And uh, we will pick it back up then. I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to you that um, we wanted to ask you to close the public hearing. You've now had several hours, many hours worth of public hearing over uh, two nights that were well publicized and well attended. Everybody who requested to be heard had an opportunity to be heard, including several who were heard twice now. The purpose of a public hearing is to get public comment. Everybody who has wanted to speak more than once has been heard, and there's really not a basis for keeping the public hearing open. It doesn't mean that the board can't discuss and deliberate, um, but in terms of the actual public hearing, I don't know how much more you're gonna hear or how many more people you're gonna hear from when you consider how much public comment you've already received. You can certainly continue to accept written comment. You're not making a decision yet, but we would like to ask you to consider closing the public hearing. I appreciate your position, but whether we hear from people at the next public hearing or not, we still have some discussion. We may want to ask the community for more input. So I don't think we're done yet. So uh, I'll take the motion to adjourn the public hearing. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor, could I, just, could, I just address, could I just address one or two other things very quickly? Very quickly. Yes, you can. Um, we, we are going to be um, submitting responses to some of the comments that we heard tonight in writing. I think we heard a number of inaccuracies um, that need to be corrected for the record. Um, we also wanted to let the board know, that since there were numerous references to the substantial waivers tonight, we've actually been looking at the waivers and looking at the way the zoning code actually reads. Um, we've had some discussion with the building department. We think that at the end of the day, there's actually only one waiver, and that's for building height. And we'll be presenting that information to you and, and talking to the building department for confirmation on that as well. But we think it is, it is one waiver. Um, so, okay, that, that's and, and fair that enough, and that's another clarified. reason for us to keep this dialogue going then. So, um, well, I, I don't I think, think that really is the reason for public comment, but um, we, we will be providing that information. Um, and, and just the one thing, we kept hearing parking. This project provides more than the required parking. Six spaces in excess. There was also a lot of incorrect information provided on how many spaces on the street will be lost. We'll address that in our submission as well. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'll take a motion to adjourn the, uh, adjourn the public hearing. Is there a motion? Trustee Flynn, second. Trustee Corrales, discussion all in favor? And that passes with seven eyes. So we've adjourned and we will reopen and we'll let you all know when that happens. Thanks very much for your input. Thank you all.